Hello again, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Virtual Southern. Uh, I'm Sean Delaney from Delaney and Sons. We're joined again by uh, Diggory Haddock uh, from Shropshire, England, a vintage gun enthusiast and a prolific author. I'm sure most of you know his work. His first gun, I think, was Vintage Guns for the Modern Shot. Then he did a book on the uh, British box lock gun and rifle. And then his most recent publication is uh, Hammer Guns in Theory and Practice, all of which I have and all of which I've read at least once, but more than once. Uh, so welcome, Diggory. It's nice to see you again. You sure. So uh, sorry we're going to miss you next weekend at the, the Southern. It's one of our favorite events of the whole season. Uh, we were excited that you were going to be coming over and uh, – so really disappointed not to, to see you, not to see everybody, but really glad you're able to take the time to, to meet with us today. Yeah, thank you. I'm really disappointed not to be there. It's, uh, it's been such a good event in the past, and there's so many small groups of American enthusiasts for English guns that always put on some activities that are worth having a play with. The, the, uh, the, the guys with the double rifles in particular, uh, who tend to set up the, uh, the plastic water bottles and home load a lot of big calibers, that's about as much fun as you can have on a Sunday afternoon, I think, it's fabulous. So yeah, very unhappy that I'm not gonna be there, but uh, I, I just hope everybody stays safe and we'll be there for next year. Absolutely. Um, well, just uh, wanna sort of have a general conversation about uh, vintage guns and uh, all of it's in the book, but, uh, or in the books, but first wanted to see just how you personally got into vintage guns. Um, I suppose if you go right back to the beginning, I was sort of eight year old with an air rifle and, uh, and my best friend Jason was another eight year old with an air rifle and we grew up in the countryside like a lot of us do and spent our time wandering around shooting things with air rifles with limited success but you know, we, we, we didn't have very much else to do and we applied ourselves to it and took care of a few rats and sparrows around the chicken runs and things and the odd rabbit. Um, and my school teacher, Tony Shepherd, was, uh, was a gun collector. It was a small village school, and uh, he used to go to the gun auctions in Birmingham, Weller and Dufty, and come back on a Monday morning every now and again and say, hey, boys, come and look at what we bought at the auction. And on his desk, he'd have five or six various rifles and pistols and shotguns and things that you could come and have a play with. So that always tickled our interest. And, kept it going. And my, my dad had a modest collection of 10 or 15 random guns from everything from a, you know, a Martini Henry up to a, a small, uh, small, short magazine, Lee Enfield, uh, Winchester, uh, Lever Action, with an octagonal barrel in 4440 and oh, yeah. various other things. And so I used to go into his when he was away and fiddle about with his guns and have a look at them. And, uh, and it just stayed with me as an interest. I, I hung out with the gamekeeper, went shooting and trapping squirrels and things. And then I met a chap called Peter Williams, who was uh, set up a gun shop in Ludlow. And he was connected to the Birmingham gun trade and used to take me in to his shop and take me into the gun quarter in Birmingham with my dad's camera to take photographs of guns that he wanted to have for sale. So. Uh, back in those pre-internet days, it would be a case of taking the old Pentax in there and taking some photographs and uh, sending them off by envelope to somebody and then, you know, correspondence by letter would go to and fro until a sale was done. Um, I wish I'd taken some more photographs of the insides of Baylons and some of those Price Street workshops because uh, a lot of those are no longer there. And that was, uh, that was the early 80s, so it would have been quite a nice snapshot of history. Yeah, that's a uh, highway now, isn't it? Um, well, it was already, the, the Bull Ring and the Birmingham uh, Ring Road was already then at, at that time, but a, a lot of the, the old shops in Price Street just have closed over the years. Yeah. So what is it about the vintage guns? I mean, you can go and buy a Beretta or a Parazzi and then they'll pull the trigger, it goes bang. What, what is it about the vintage guns that's so appealing? Well, I suppose I, I would liken it to people who like cars. You can go out and buy a Toyota Corolla and it'll, it'll do fine. You know, it starts and it stops and it's got air conditioning and a good radio and it's comfortable and you don't need to maintain it or worry about it. Um, or you can go and buy a vintage Jaguar and, um, and, and constantly be fiddling around with oil leaks and, um, and replacement parts and 
various elements of restoration, but something about sitting in that and smelling the leather and driving it and feeling the connection with the road with a much simpler piece of equipment that appeals to some people. And I think with vintage guns, that's very similar. Um, the intrinsic um, you know, quality of the engineering and of the artistry in guns and the, the hand-built quality of them uh, marks them apart from simply being a piece of sporting equipment like a ski or a golf club. Now, I know, I mean, it's sort of a, a subset and it's, it's, it's a, a cliff that I haven't jumped off yet, but when we first met, it was back in 2015 near Brecon, uh, you were coming shooting with us for the day and you brought a hammer gun and uh, it was an old hammer gun. It was a name that I didn't recognize. Uh, beautiful gun and uh, pretty much had the tallest birds of the day, so it seemed to work pretty well. Um, so what is it about hammer guns and is that something that's accessible to people and can you really use them in everyday use? Well, I do. Um, uh, we were talking about the limitations of, of ammunition which are coming up and uh, you know, we may see over here that steel shot becomes an issue and no, you, for a lot of hammer guns you can't use steel shot in them because they just have got all sorts of issues to do with the, um, the size of the bore. A lot of old English guns have got very tight bores, very tight forcing cones and very tight choke cones, although some of the earlier ones don't have any choke at all, so they win on that in that respect. Um, you also have to be careful with the, um, the fact that these guns have been around for a very long time and may have seen some neglect and, ba and or bad gunsmithing. So being able to ascertain the, the condition of your barrels and the other various other parts of the gun in order to, um, to work out whether or not it's, it's roadworthy and safe to use um, is, is an important thing. So either you need that expertise yourself or you need some friendly help from somebody that does. Um, but it's important to get that. But if you get the combination of quality, condition, and mechanism, and ammunition right, then hammer guns will kill just as well now as they did in 1870. Um, and 1870 shooters and 1880 shooters shot a lot of animals and birds with the equipment that was available at the time. Um, and we're fortunate that these things were so well made that if reasonably well looked after, or at least not too badly neglected, um, with a bit of servicing and maintenance, they are as capable today as they've ever been. So absolutely, there's no reason at all why you can't do all your shooting with a hammer gun. Now, what about safety? Are they as safe as a hammerless gun? Well, I would say, like most things, in the hands of a skilled operator, then, then yes. Um, like any piece of equipment, you need to understand how it works and practice how to use it properly. And if you do those two things, then it's as safe as anything. I would say, arguably, that a hammer gun is safer than your average breech loader because with a hammer gun, you've got two safety catches which are visible, and those are the hammers. So if the hammers aren't pulled back, you cannot fire that gun, even if the gun is closed. If you're using a hammerless gun and the gun is closed, that gun is fully cocked and in all probability, unless you've got a very high quality uh, uh, older gun, the only thing stopping that striker from hitting that cartridge is, um, is a trigger block. So it, that'll stop you pulling the triggers by mistake and firing the gun. But if the sear fails, the gun goes off. If you jolt it and the sear jumps out, the gun goes off, uh, regardless of your safety catch being on. Whereas, as I say, with a hammer gun, if those hammers aren't pulled back, you can't fire that gun. And even if something was to happen, proper safety dictates that even if it did go off, it wouldn't hurt anyone. Absolutely. Well, that, that's true of, of any gun. But that extra um, layer of safety with a hammer gun is that you simply can't have an accidental discharge of a hammer gun that doesn't have cocked hammers. Now, what about the difference between you go rebounding locks and non-rebounding locks. I mean, is there a benefit one over the other or is it different situations where you'd prefer to have one? No, um, non-rebounding locks exist because uh, at that time, the, the, the uh, concept of a rebounding lock hadn't been thought of. So it, it tends to be older guns, 1860s, early 1870s guns that have um, non-rebounding locks. And then following, 
few patterns, most notably Stanton's um, of 1867, you then see, see rebounding locks basically take over. Um, the reason for that is that they're faster to operate and they don't require you to pull the, gun, the, the hammer back to half cock in order to open the gun. So you don't inadvertently find yourself trying to crack, crank a gun open while the stripers are stuck hard in the, uh, in, in the cartridges. Uh, I've got a couple here as examples. Uh, this, that's broken. There. <laughs> uh, this, uh, I don't know how well you can see that. Yep. That's a lot from a George Smith. Um, it's a peninsula backlock with uh, non rebounding hammers. So there it is at full cock. There it is fired. Now, when you want to open the gun, you put it back to half cock. Now you can retract, your, your tri strikers will retract and you can pull it back and to fire it, full cock. And you can see the sears locking into the bents there. So otherwise, when you break the gun, you run the risk of breaking off your firing bends, right? Yeah, now this one, is a Henry Atkin, and this is a rebounding lock. So that's it in fired position. That's it in cocked position, and there's no half cock. Gotcha. You'll, you'll notice the difference there. The, um, the rebounding lock has a main spring that comes right up to the to the, the same level for the top and bottom springs. And yeah. now it's in a swivel, whereas the non-rebounding lock doesn't have a swivel, it goes straight onto the, uh, onto the, the hammer. That makes sense. So, so the thing was the, uh, the, the rebounding lock was simply quicker. Here's a, here's a non-rebounder, that's a Purdy. Um, I'll talk, to, talk about this a little bit more in a minute because it's an interesting gun which I think readers would be interested or viewers would like but this has got non-rebounding locks half cock full cock now um yeah so a lot of rebounding locks were converted non-rebounding locks were converted to rebound um later and there's no as I say there's no advantage to, to non-rebounding locks they're simply a, a legacy of history um, having said that, um, one of my favourite guns is a gun with non-rebounding locks uh, made by W. Thorne of, of Pall Mall um, in about 1874. Um, like anything, if you get used to shooting it and you get into a rhythm whereby you fire your gun, you drop the, drop the barrels down, you go back to half cock, you open the gun, pull out your cartridges, put in some more cartridges, close the gun, <laughs> go back to full cock and shoot. If you do it in an unhurried rhythm, you get used to it. Now, people often say with hammer guns, you know, they're so slow, how can you manage to shoot? How can you go on a driven pheasant day where you've got pheasants pouring over your head and, and shoot a hammer gun where everybody else is firing hammer, uh, hammerless ejectors and shooting really fast? Well, my answer to that, to that is speed is only an issue if you care, and I don't. So I've, te I've tested various hammer guns, and for example, I've got a Purdy snap under lever with a thumb hole lever. Your people will be familiar with that. Yep. I can fire 14 aim shots a minute with that. Now, if I'm killing 14 pheasants a minute on a driven pheasant day, my day is going to be over very soon, or it'll be a very expensive day. <laughs> so, so, so it's good enough for me. Yeah. And I think also people overlook the fact that now when we go on a driven day, we're not there to fire as many cartridges as possible and kill as many pheasants as possible. A lot of the time you're, you're closing your gun, you're looking up in the air, you'll see the pheasants in the air. Now, some of them may be worth raising your gun to and shooting at, and some of them may not be. But you, I spend a lot of my time standing there at ready waiting for the bird I want to shoot and watching birds go past me that I don't want to shoot. 
in the old days when it was all about numbers, it was simply close the gun, shoot the nearest bird or the next bird you see and keep firing and killing as many as you can. So you can go and tell your mate how many more than him you shot. Because it was a numbers game. But it's not a numbers game anymore, at least you know, in, the, in the sort of sporting circles that you and I mix in, it's not considered a numbers game. It really isn't. It really isn't. Couldn't agree more. Um, well, I'd like to look at that Purdy that you had there. The, the, the last question I had on safety is you have, you have people, especially here in the United States, because we've got some unfortunate histories, but um, people are nervous about Damascus and yes. you have Damascus steel. Yeah, Damascus is, um, is an interesting material because it's not just one material. You can, it's used basically to describe any kind of barrel material which, uh, which consists of a number of different rods of iron or steel hammer welded together around a mandrel. Now it can just be one piece of steel, which, which is a stub Damascus or a scalp, uh, which is hammered around a mandrel. So that's very rather plain, it's got a few flecks in it. Or it can be super um, intricately um, intertwined six steel crawl, something like that. Some of the Belgian stuff is really, really fancy. But um, Damascus barrels came in a range of qualities from very cheap to very expensive. And there were some tests done by the proof house um, uh, and over, so it's seen by Webley uh, back at the turn of the century. Turn of the, ninth, of the 19th to the 20th century. Yeah. And, and of the, the, the steels that they, the barrel tubes that they tested, which was a destruction test, so they, they'd fire a charge through the barrel and then they'd lap out a fag, and then they'd fire a charge again and lap out another fag, and keep firing until that barrel showed material deviation. So a rivel, a bulge, a burst, yeah. um, anything like that. Any, any, anything that the viewer could see had changed materially on the back barrel after firing. Once that happened, it was put, set aside and, and given a number. And when they carried on, they carried on doing that until basically they had a, they had a, a scale from one to, for argument, say a hundred, I forget how many were in the final test, um, of which ones were the strongest and which ones weren't. And even things like Whitworth steel, Siemens Martin steel, um, which were fluid pressed steels available at the time and by far the most expensive. Um, they came, uh, the best one was Whitworth steel and that was number four on the list. Um, above that were, were three different types of English Damascus. Wow. So as a material itself, Damascus has always been absolutely suitable for gun barrel making and, and remains so. Uh, where you've got to watch out for Damascus is the fact that a lot of the guns that you'll find Damascus barrels on are very old and they've been neglected and the barrels are not in the condition that they once were. So it's about evaluating condition rather than being afraid of Damascus as an inherently weaker material, which it isn't. Understood. That makes sense. Well, how about that, uh, the purdy you had there? Yeah, this purdy is an interesting one. Um, a few unusual things about it. Uh, one, one is this. You'll notice that there's no, um, there's no checkering on the forend. Uh, also, it's got a side nail, which uh, is normally indicative of the gun being being relatively early. You know, you normally think early 1870s to, um, through the 1860s, early 1870s, for that side nail to be the method of attaching it to the fore, the fore end to the barrels. It's a hangover from muzzle loader days. It's very secure. But it's it's a pain in the ass to fit. It, it, it's a uh, it's a very time consuming, tricky. Um, Part to fit onto a gun, uh, requiring a lot of skill, um, and it also requires um, you know a, a rudimentary tool to to take it off. But um, you, this gun is actually made in 1899. Hmm. Very unusual to find that on a gun made in 1899. Yeah, the Purdy. Uh, by that time, they were using Anson push rods, which we're all familiar with. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this as I said before, is that it's, um, it, it's got that side nail, but it's also, you probably can't see it here, but it's got Whitworth steel barrels. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Whitworth steel barrels didn't really start getting used by Purdy until the, 18, the early 1890s. So we've, we've got a bit of confusion there. And these Whitworth steel barrels are <laughs> 34 wow. inches long. <laughs> wow. So, curiouser and curiouser. Again, 1899, non-rebounding locks. As I say, Purdy had started making rebounding locks, certainly by 1867. So why are we looking at an 1899 Purdy with rebounding locks? Um, again, the action. Very old, yeah. Jones underlever and screw grip, patented in 1859, certainly obsolete for a quality Purdy gun in 12 bore, which is what this is, by 1899. Nice French walnut stock. Very nice. But look at the uh, look at the butt plate. Hmm. Wow. Very reminiscent of a muzzle loader. Yeah with the full steel that comes all the way up here. So again, very unusual gun. Um, heavy action, this gun weighs nine pounds, nine ounces. Wow. Side clips, massive action. It looks like a 10 bore. Yeah. Um, so there we have a 34 inch Whitworth steel barreled Purdy. No checker on the fore end. Best quality French walnut stock with a muzzle loader type butt plate, a nine and a pounds nine ounce Jones underlever action with non rebounding locks. Interestingly, when this gun was made, for a massive gun like this, you would think it would be a wild fanning gun. Yeah. No, it was chambered with two and a half inch chambers, which was the standard, and it was proved for uh, one and one eighth of an ounce of number six shot. It was patterned for. Um, no choke in either barrel. So you've got a, a wild fouling gun weight, obsolete mechanisms all over it, modern steel barrels, no choke, short chambers regulated for standard game load. The gun makes no sense at all. It's a one of one. Can't imagine they made more than one of those. Well, why do you think it is what it is? It sounds like something Charles Gordon would ask for, actually. That's exactly right. It's oh, really? a Charles Gordon gun. It was made for Charles Gordon in 1899. The, um, those, those telltale signs, are, you, know, you add all those up and it's exactly what you've got. Um, he, he had a few Purdy's made. I think, I think not as, certainly not as many as Dixon's made for him. Dixon's made 200 odd guns, I think. But um, Purdy's, I think, made six or seven. But there are two other guns very similar to this, but with 32 inch barrels. Um, I was offered one by a chap in Australia a little while ago. Um, slightly lighter, about eight and a half pounds with 32 inch barrels, but otherwise almost the twin of this. Um, yeah, Gordon had some very strange stuff made. Uh, and that's one of them. Now we were talking about markets earlier, and and how this uh, you know, these impending led legislation changes in the UK might impinge on gun buying. I think stuff like this it won't make any difference because this is collector for that. Um, and I think there's enough interest in English guns from people who are intrinsically interested in them that the fact you can't go and shoot um, thousands of cartridges made of you know, with steel shot in them out of them isn't really going to affect them all that much. I think it's going to affect people who are you know, your average pigeon shooter who might be shooting a 1930s box lock um, that's worth a few hundred quid, who now decides he's going to go out and buy himself a cheap over and under so he can shoot steel yeah. because he shoots two or 300 shots a day on pigeons and can't afford to do these business in a box lock. I think those sorts of guys will start to start to get rid of their English guns. But I think, I think your, uh, you know, any hopes from the, uh, the, the wider gun collecting community that we're gonna see 
England start to hemorrhage all its classic old purdies and things because the English are too mean to buy bismuth to shoot their pheasants with is, is a little bit of wishful thinking. Um, certainly the last Holtz auction that we saw, um, there wasn't a massive dumping of English side locks onto the sale. The sale went very well. Um, prices seem to be holding up. I saw a pair of Purdy hammer ejectors sell for £24,000, wow. um, just the fact that they were thin barreled. Um, so the, the market is still pretty strong for the right stuff. And that's been the case for a long time. Although it's, uh, it's certainly depressed from what it was 10 years ago. I think, you know, we're seeing really across the board um, in, the, in the English market, um, guns are making two, two thirds of what they were making 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, if you've got someone who wants to get into the vintage gun or wants to get into the, the vintage hammer gun, I mean, we all know the big names from London. Uh, are there any provincial makers, especially in the hammer category, that sort of rise to the top for you? Um, I always say to people, buy, don't, buy, don't go by maker. I, I get contacted all the time by people saying, I've got a gun by this maker. Is, it, is this a good maker? Now, the top two or three makers that you could name, or four or five perhaps, who specialised in the, the best guns during the time that they were selling to the wealthiest clients. But, um, but most guns, truth be told, sold a range of guns from not very expensive to super quality. So yeah. judge the gun by its quality, not by the name on it, its locks. Um, I, think, um, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of, 1870s guns, you know, Jones underlever types uh, with rebounding or non-rebounding locks that are of extremely good quality, built by all sorts of provincial makers and Birmingham makers. Um, and they're, they're underappreciated because they don't carry a big name. Yep. And uh, if you can start to spot quality and shop according to that, rather than go around trying to find a big name gun for cheap money, which is always hard work because everybody can do that. Um, that's where you, you end up with quality and value. Um, I mean, I mentioned the gun by W. Thorne, which, uh, which is one of my favorites. No one's ever heard of him. To my knowledge, there are only four other guns that he made that are known about. Wow. He, was only, he was only in his premises for, for, for two, two years, 1874 to 76, before Watson Brothers took over. So he's nobody. My other, one of my other favorite guns is by Jay Thompson. No address, so I don't know which Jay Thompson he was, uh, but nobody's heard of him, nobody recognises him. I've shot more with that gun than I've shot with anything else. Um, I, I personally very much like Stephen Grant um, hammer guns. I've, I've had several in my time. My current favourite is a 16 bore bar action side lever Stephen Grant um, 16 bore, which I've, I did up a couple of seasons ago. And, um, and I, I enjoy shooting that very much. I'm lucky to find one that was, uh, had a broken right mainspring and had clearly been put away decades and decades ago. Yeah. Uh, not been used very much. Um, and though it was grubby and dirty and needed a good bit of work on it, it now looks like it, it, it should look. And it, um, we didn't need to, to do much, too much to it. The checker was still good. The case coloring was all there. Wow. Um, Barrels had never been lapped out, you know. So, although we had to do some work to it, you know, we managed to pull it back to the way I like them without having to uh, do too much. That's great. Well, I appreciate your time. I um, and I know that uh, everyone who couldn't make the event, uh, you know, hopefully enjoy uh, watching the videos that we're putting out. Um, I do know we talked about it before, but you know, if people want to learn more about vintage guns, obviously they can uh, can order your books. And uh, they can go to your website, uh, vintageguns.co.uk. Uh, but the other thing there, I mean, the, the books are a great resource, but there's also a new resource that you've put out that has a little more uh, current information, I understand. Yeah, the Vintage Gun Journal, is, it uploads monthly. Um, it's free to view. You can view this month's, um, on the first of each month, um, articles by me, by Donald Dallas, by Nick Harlow, who's the gun room manager at Purdy by Tom Danes, who's a professional hunter, by all sorts of people who are knowledgeable and have expertise in various areas. Um, I think the production qualities of it are good. We spent a good bit of money on it earlier 
uh, towards the end of last year. I think we relaunched in August last year. And it's really there as a resource for enthusiasts and it's free to view. And um, I would encourage people to tell their friends, go and have a look at it and, uh, and enjoy it. And if you've got some particular area of interest that you've managed to gather a lot of information about, submit an article, we'll publish it if it's any good. That's great. Well, thanks again for the time. Uh, stay safe and uh, can't wait to see you either, either over in uh, England or over here in the States. Well, thanks for taking the effort to put all this together, Sean. I hope people appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's all Liz, though. She gets all the credit. <laughs> of course, I should have known. <laughs> Cheers. Bye-bye.